The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. Here's Brandon. All right, welcome to the Brandon Peters Show and the final installment in the series that we have been calling. This series has been a weekend by weekend look at the movies released during the summer of 1982. That was the year I was born. It was the year Scott turned one, two, two. Scott turned two. Uh, yeah, Scott Mendelson's here. He's might have been my guest this whole time, but you fucking know that because you've been watching, you've been watching or listening to this the whole time. Welcome back, Scott. It's a single episode. Yeah, drop an f bomb right at the beginning of this. You know it's the end. You know the movies are great. We're talking about this episode is the final. What we're deeming the final weekend of summer. I'm sure this that, is the end. Yeah, beautiful it, friend. Yes, this is um, the end. My only friend yes. of our elaborate plans. That's all I got. Yeah, it's uh, August 27th through 29th, 1982, which I think that the 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 the, 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 the studios gave uh, this was not part of summer programming but who knows we're at the end we're we've made it through we did this we did this and didn't skip a beat amazing um summer loving happened so fast scott summer loving had me a blast but it was something we could only hope that was the great thing we want and it's right i hope you had the time of your life oh wow I might be doing this the entire show because it's more fun than talking about the terrible movies. Right. We want to skip the movies and just bullshit for an hour. I'm, I'm good with that. Summer of 82. Oh. I will remember you. Will you remember? E- if you don't e- subscribe two. to the Patreon, those animals will die. Yes, they will. They die very well. And I've been putting... Angel. This whole time, I've been putting stuff up early, too. So if you're on Patreon, you got stuff early. Yeah. Oh, that's how good this week is. Singing songs and <laughs> de- delaying getting to the movies we're talking about this week. Um, terrible, when we started this, Scott, we were like, well, it can't get this bad anymore. It got worse. It can get worse. It can get worse. I needed Phoebe Cates. I needed Phoebe Cates. I did get cars doing stuff, but not good. Oh, uh, gosh. Uh, what else? What did we have that first week as well? Um, we had Phoebe Cates. We had the car. Oh, we did. We yeah, could have used some Corman. Up. We could have had the Corman thing like this. That this was, was like, fun. hey, guess what? It can get worse. And it's going to be. Hold on, folks. Stick with us because. We might not survive. <laughs> Cliffhanger. This is the season finale. This is and the he, finale. Do not miss the last five minutes. Yes. You won't believe. All right. So let's, as always, let's move on to our uh, news of the moment segment for this week. It's the news of the moment. Oh, uh, August 23rd. Lebanese philanthropist leader Bashir Gamal is elected as president. Uh, what? What? It wouldn't be a summer of '82 at 40 episode if I didn't tell you about a nuclear test going on on August 23rd. The USSR did this one at Eastern Kazakh. Uh, USSR. Sorry to 
throw that out there, but it's nuclear tests. Not cool. Um, on August 26, NASA launches the Telesat F satellite. All right. I mentioned last time there's been a recurring character throughout the summer of 82. Before. He had the he had one of the biggest summers of 82, as we have found out. Uh, on August 27th, Ricky Henderson stole his 119th base of the season, breaking Lou Brock's mark. It was a he like as we went through this summer, this guy was breaking a record on a every other week base. There was something about Ricky Henderson stealing bases. Like when I was growing up, that was what he was known for. Stealing the bit. Yeah, that's yeah. He was the guy that he stole base. Like that's what he did. He had just had to get on it. Walk, hit, bean. You didn't want him on first base. <laughs> um, August 28th, the first gay games are held in San Francisco. Um, uh, not June. Um, in August 20, also on that day, the 39th at the 39th Venice Film Festival, the State of Things, directed by Wim Wenders, wins the Golden Lion. And on August 29th, 38 degrees Fahrenheit, the lowest temperature ever recorded in Cleveland in August happened. So, Scott's ho- some hometown, home state news for Scott there. Hometown pride. Hometown pride. Uh, we'll move on. Our desk this week were St- uh, Stanford Moore, a biochemist and Nobel Prize winner, and John A.M. Hans von Tongren. Uh, committed suicide at age 27, like a teen star person who's on a show, Honk. Um, yeah, RIP. Why is it always 27? 20, yeah, that's a, that's the Kurt Cobain, Jimi Hendrix, Mama Cass. Yeah, that's the age. Um, our birthdays, happier stuff. Swimmer Natalie Coughlin was born. John Mulaney, born this week. And Leanne Rhymes. But you know what that means, Scott? No, I don't. We're older than them. Well, yeah, that, yeah, that I knew. Seniority, yeah. Mulaney. Seniority. <sighs> Take that. I got that on you. I'm older by like eight months. But hey, uh, <laughs> speaking of opposite of John Mulaney, the junk man. Junk man. Grips, get ready. I want to dive on this Jaguar. Lights on the hood. We're going to run down the riverbed. Hoy, we're going to have a little action here, baby. From the maker of Gone in 60 Seconds, the chase thriller of the 70s, comes the chase thriller of the 80s, the junk man. From junk cars to movie stars, Harlan Hollis is the American dream, worth millions, and now someone wants it all. Yeah, the junk man lives with his life on the line. They're trying to kill him and he's running out of time. He loves his cars and he loves his child. He's a millionaire and born too wild. Michael, why do they call him the junk man? Before he decided to get into the movie making business, he was in the auto junk business, and now he collects stuff. Fans from around the world gather here to pay tribute to a great American legend, the brilliant star of East of Eden, Giant, and the classic Rebel Without a Cause. Arlen B. Hollis will hereafter be referred to only as the target. Deadly assassins with their aircraft and speeding cars close in for the kill. He did his own stunts in his movies, but this time he's driving for his life. Don't hit me! The Junkman brings you intense high-speed action. Witness the destruction of over 150 vehicles in some of the most daring airplane car and blimp stunts ever filmed. Yeah, the junk man drives like a bat out of hell. His dreams come true like a ring and a bell. The bombs and the bullets are coming his way, and his money won't help him get away today. It's time to put the fun back in the theater with entertainment for the entire family. The junk man, two years in the making. The chase thriller of the 80s, rated PG. Junk man. This is our first movie this week. Uh, the directed by H.B. Halicki, known to people as the Car Crash King. He also wrote this movie. He also starred in this movie. He produced this movie. But also starring in this movie is Christopher Stone, Lang Jeffries, Susan Shaw, Linda Day George, and Hoyt Axton as himself. Pre-Gremlins. Uh, junk man and movie maker Harlan Hollis struggles to stay alive when a jealous partner in his company hires goons to kill him 
full of amazing car chases, fantastic crashes, and edge of your seat action. So, Halicki, this guy, you're like, who the f- is this guy? Write and direct. Produ- he wrote and directed Gone in 60 Seconds. That's his credit. He would also do the stunt coordination. He drove the car Eleanor. They were not the Nicolas Cage one, the original one. Um, and he cashed in like literally his chips with this movie. Like he owned all the stuff from that movie. He bought it up after or something, and he made this movie and another one with it for like a trilogy of movies that he did. Um, but Scott, I'm assuming this is your first time seeing the junk man. Yeah, it is. Um, and honestly, I mean, I'm impressed by how it was made. You know, obviously a lot of it's you know, practical action and, and perilous stunts that allegedly went wrong, resulting in various injuries, as apparently seemed to happen on his movies a lot. Um, but there's, for me, there wasn't anything there except the visceral, you know, the, the action itself. You know, it wasn't, it didn't have all the other stuff that you need for a relatively successful movie, compelling characters, interesting plot, yada, yada, yada. To me, to me, this felt like a closed line for, you know, car carnage, which is fine. But other than that, it just, it didn't do much for me. Um, it is certainly no gun in 60 seconds. And I can see, fair or not, why this film, as you said, he was putting his chips in, did not result in a, you know, this this wasn't his Empire Strikes Back, where he bet the farm on himself and it paid off. Yeah, it, it, he, this is, this is one of those movies where a guy makes a movie about himself being this awesome guy. Like, these are annoying. Like, he's it's like a an, terrible idea. He's like the Neil Breen of his time, uh, but you probably better filmmaker. But um, yeah, it's just this man. This guy's great, and you're like, who's this guy? This this actor playing him? Oh, he wrote it. Oh, he directed it. Oh, he produced it. Oh, he financed it. Just make a movie that goes, look at me, I'm awesome. And this Space these, Jam, a new legacy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These movies just kind of are like, Mwah. but yeah, that's what this is. Uh, and you mentioned like, yeah. Lots of major accidents and almost deaths happened in this movie. It held the Guinness Book of World Records for the most number of vehicles and planes wrecked in one movie for more than 20 years, only being eclipsed by the Matrix Revolutions in 2003. Just revolutions? Uh yeah. Revolutions. I would have think of it I would think it would I, be the, reloaded. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why Did they actually build all those flying squid monsters. <laughs> is there like a, is there a scene where stuff just gets totaled out? But it said revolutions. A, but um, look that up. But that was beaten by Transformers Three, which had that oh that tracks had almost double. Um, but yeah, so plenty of stunts, plenty of crashes, explosion chases. But like, there's zero weight to anything. Like in this movie, no. it's just carnage footage with nothing to it. Uh, the guy owned all the cars. They're they're from the ground in sixty seconds. Eleanor from that movie's in this, and it's just like there's nothing in between. And the 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 stunt stuff, like the car, these action sequences are over long. There's some, you know, as much as I'm, this is a shitty film. Like there's some impressive stuff in here though. Like there's some good, there's some coverage that you're like, holy crap, like probably because they're putting stuff in danger, but when you can do all, it's insane. They have, they are asking on this for somebody to die or be mortally <laughs> wounded with all this happening. And it's not this film this summer that fucks up. It's twilight zone that has a helicopter oh, crash. Christ. This movie was <laughs> wanting that to happen and it doesn't twilight zone. That's just old school negligence on the part of. Uh, you know, can I can I blame John Landis without getting sued? Go go right ahead. <laughs> I think we get um, more anyway. trouble. I think we get more trouble for saying Leonard Malton might not have returned to a movie after getting up. <laughs> hey, I, I took the code of silence on that one. I tried to uh, pull you from the brink. From Chuck Norris, I, I'll I'll own up to that. I didn't say. I just say he didn't come back and sit next to me again. Um, yeah, maybe you spelled. I don't remember. It was a long time ago. I used to. All right. Yeah, um, yeah. But 
<laughs> and Scott has no sense of smell, so he doesn't know. So um, this, this is also true. Uh, this movie also has that weird thing where it like pushes that James Dean myth that he like did three movies and died. Like, because there's like a James Dean festival. And she's like, James Dean, the actor who did three, le- three leading roles before passing away. I'm like, James Dean has a roster of performances. Like, they act like this. He was breaking out as a star, but he did like a lot of stuff. Like, it's so funny that like there's this myth that I don't think, I don't know if it's around anymore, but back in the day, it was like, Oh man, it is East of Eden and the Rebel Without Cause and the Giant he died. And that's all we have. It's three movies. My daughter's name comes from a soap opera thing he did back in um, the day. It was a Campbell Soup Theater or whatever. And there was a, that's where I got her name from. Like, was that. And that was because my, I had a professor, college professor was doing a book. Um, on James Dean and doing research. And he's like, you guys got to check this out. I found this old thing. And yeah, if you look him up on this podcast, we respect trouble along the way and fix bayonets. Damn it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks for looking those up. While I was talking. <laughs> Trying to be subtle about it, but, <laughs> but yeah. Oh man. But also this has hap. It has some haphazard, like jolty edits and such that make it like really hard to follow this movie and what's going on. It's kind of uneasy to watch, even in a conversational or relaxed scene. Like it just doesn't, it, someone doesn't know how to make a movie right at, at some point here because it doesn't play pretty and it like, it just, it's all over the place a bit. Yeah, that, um, that, my weird feeling is that, you know, obviously the stunts are incredible. The actual action set pieces are impressive on the surface, but it, it wasn't a competently made movie. No, uh, there needed to be someone other than H.B. Halicki working on this movie. Like, yeah. there really did. And, and maybe that's the difference between an H.B. Halicki and a George Miller. Yeah. You know, obvious, among other things. <laughs> but because, I mean, the whole, you know, obviously, you know, months earlier, we had the Road Warrior, which also seemed like a film that where, you know, to my knowledge, no one got seriously injured on that set. Mm-hmm. But the, same thing with Fury Road. It's like, I think it was Soderbergh that said, "How is this not being filmed? And how have how multiple people been killed?" Yeah. Paraphrasing, but right. Um, yeah. The, uh, this, there was that funny part where that guy was like, "Yeah, and I'm Woody Allen." And like the comedy <laughs> looked just he looked just like Woody Allen. It was funny. yeah. Uh, I actually got I got a little cackle out of that. But yeah, it, it's all this action, all this. But for what? Like, has like the silliest plot in the like what the. the I'm jealous. Let's go kill this guy. Whatever. Um, the end credits are a highlight reel, and which at the end of the day, that's what this movie works best as is a highlight reel. Yes. Like, you know, as much as I loathe this kind of entertainment consumption, you could probably get most of what you need out of this from watching a best best card crashes in the Junkman YouTube compilation or something. Right. Which, uh, yeah, there was probably more entertaining things on TV this week as we go to the Nielsen oh, rating. Oh, segue. Oh, yeah. Yep. I only got a couple more of those left in me. Try the laughing cure here at the 4077. Fun is still our best prescription for making it through the craziness. We're operating to entertain you. And we're right here. Yes. <laughs> Weeknights at 7, 6 Central on MeTV. Um, but the top 10 ratings to finish out in Scott. Closing out number one on TV this week was MASH, CBS. Uh, number two, two. Okay, go ahead. Number two, Too Close for Comfort on ABC. You got the theme for that one? No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> number. <laughs> I did use it in one of these episodes as the backdrop for this segment. Uh, number three, Three's Company on ABC. Nope, no, Scott. Okay. Number four, Filthy Rich on CBS. Oh, everybody remembers that one, right? No. Uh, and number five, Jefferson, CBS. Moving on up on the way east side. A D. He locks up. Po- I don't remember. It's been a while. Okay, I think you got the next one down. Finally, Easy. have the piece oh. of the pie. Okay. Okay, I think the next one you got down. Uh, uh, sixty minutes on CBS. I was like on one point five play. 
Um, number seven, WKRP on CBS. Cincinnati, WKRP. All right, number eight, Alice on CBS. Alice! I don't know if that's his name. I just was doing that. <laughs> number nine, Trapper John, MD on CBS. I'm a trapper. Trap John, it's MD and me just trapping John. I'm Trapper John, MD. I'm Trapper John. Trapping those MDs, I'm Trapper John. Oh no, now I'm trapped myself. (laughs) Irony. All right, and lastly, number 10, Hill Street Blues on NBC. (laughs) That one I actually vaguely remember. Be careful out there. They're like, they're like, God, man, I like the summer of 82 at 40 in that last episode. They just fucking blew it. They were, just, they were <laughs> singing were they, all the... Were they, were they drunk? They yes, sing, we were. They, they were doing all the theme songs, and they are just procrastinating talking about these really <laughs> bad movies because they really didn't want to talk about the bad movies. Uh, and he just, he was a little loopy because he got sunburned. It's just starting to cause a fever. <laughs> so I'm just delirious. I'm fine. It's, I think I got my, I took my, my son swimming today. Oh, okay. And it was very warm. Even uh, though I put on sunscreen, apparently it wasn't enough. This is the stuff that people want to know. Um, yep. All right. So uh, next movie we have today is Jackal and Hyde. <gasps> dot, dot, dot. Together again. outrageous comedy of the year. Jekyll and Hyde together again, and they're still crazy after all these years. I am the doctor! You need a doctor! Rated R. Now showing at the Royal and Geneva Drive in San Francisco, the Plaza Daily City. Directed by Jerry Belson. Written by Monica McGowan. Oh, Monica McGowan Johnson, Harvey Miller, and Jerry Belson. Starring Mark Blankfield, Bess Armstrong, Krista Erickson, Tim Thomerson, Cassandra Peterson. That's Elvira, everybody. Liz Sheridan and Michael McGuire. Not Lizzie. All right. Dr. Daniel Jekyll, researching into drugs that would help mankind avoid surgery, discovers a white powder that unleashes the animal in every man, and in his case, turning him from a shy and timid doctor into a wild, crazed party animal to the delight and dismay of both his rich fiance and stripper girlfriend. So, all right, Scott. Um, so we have some uh, cool people working on this, I guess. Belson, he's a TV writer uh, mainly, but he wrote for I Spy, The Lucy Show, Dick Van Dyke Show, Odd Couple. He wrote Smokey and the Bandit 2. Uh, uncredited writer on Close Encounters, but you can believe that because he wrote Always and Tracy Allman Show, Andrew Carey Shoulders credits. McGowan, one of the, the uh, writers, she's like Albert Brooks' writing partner here. She wrote Modern Romance, Real Life, Lost in America, Mother, The Muse, even The Scout. So, um, yeah. Uh, Scott, tell me about Do- Jacqueline Hyde together again. Uh, this is not a good picture. No, it's not. I mean, it's obviously it's a very loose adaptation of, of Robert Louis Stevenson's horror novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Spoiler, the same person. Um, this story was obviously already used for a comic ripoff don't remake in 19, I want to say 62 for hmm. Jerry Lewis is the nutty professor. In a film oh, yeah. where Jerry Lewis, a, a very Jerry Lewis-ish, nebbish nerd professor, takes a magic post and turns into <clears throat> Dean Martin. <clears throat> Excuse me. It turns into a, a you know badass, rude, charismatic, yada yada, cool dude who's able to do all the stuff that you know Jerry Lewis's character is un- unable to do due to introversion, shyness, whatever. Um, that was, of course, remade in 1996 with Eddie Murphy's A Nutty Professor. 
which mm. as well as being a very good, funny and charming comedy, kind of acted as sort of an on-screen exorcism of Eddie Murphy's rough and tumble youth persona personified by Saturday Night Live, 48 Hours and Beverly Hills Cop. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny. I mean, I'm going to digress for a moment because this film's boring as hell. But <laughs> um, that film, you know, it's it's it was his comeback, obviously, but it was also sort of the start of a point where Eddie Murphy stopped being the creator of chaos in his comedies and started being the straight man in reaction to chaos, which often happens as comedy actors get older. Jim Carrey, yeah. Is, yeah, Jim Carrey, Adam Sandler. And that's sort of where you get a lot of the whole, oh, you know, they're not as funny as they used to be, you know, where they're all live, you know, the, the stuff they used to make in their early days. And first of all, people get older, you know, whatever. Second of all, there is a transition where you go from being the Ace Ventura uh, the you know the hurricane of comedy in an otherwise normal world mm-hmm. to being a straight man who reacts to other chaos going on. I think what's interesting about Jim Carrey is how often he has excelled at basically doing both in films like The Mask or Liar mm-hmm. Liar, um, depending on what the the you know what version of the character he's playing at any given moment. But you know people that that still yearn for the Eddie Murphy of old to come back. I mean. That was 40 years ago. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, you know Be- Beverly Hills Cop, maybe coming into America was going to be the last one. I mean, you're acting for a smaller period to come. But you act like this yeah. period was large. I mean, it was, was only was already, like a handful of years. He was already doing Boomerang by the early 90s. Like, that was. Yeah. And, you know, it's, 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 I mean, hell, the golden child was very obviously attempt for him to mm-hmm. sort of try something else. I, I enjoy that movie for what it is. Yeah. Um. And I mean, so, he's already straightening up by Beverly Hills Cop yeah. too. He's still, I mean, yeah. And by the time of Eddie, you know, the Night Professor, again, I would argue the buddy love persona in that film is very much him, you know, critically condemning, culturally condemning that persona to cultural irrelevance. Relevance. It's like mm-hmm. I don't want to be this guy anymore. Yeah, I don't want to be this rude. And again, this, you know, obviously the Eddie Murphy of of old is a comic genius and incredibly important character in the world of comedy and stand-up, but you know, he doesn't want to be that and do that anymore. He wants to be something else. Yeah. Um, I mean, he, he, he'll, he'll dip back like a bow finger or something like that. A little bit, but yeah, even, Norbit, yeah, bow yeah. Finger that, but even there, he's contrasting that with a very sweet, yes. lovable alter ego who's clearly the guy you're supposed to root for. Yes. Um, and even, you know, and I like Tower Heist. I think it's fine. I think the first act is exceptionally good, but it, it, it almost sticks up the extent to which Eddie Murphy's character is playing a guy who is almost playing an Eddie Murphy character from the 1980s um, in a movie where everyone else is just playing whoever they're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, back to Jekyll and Hyde together again, which is boring and borderline useless. And <laughs> not funny. Um, it's colorful. It yeah. looks nice. It's a, it's um, got energy. It, it does. Yeah, I, it does have energy. Yeah. Mark Blank Blankfield leaves it all on the table. I, I'll say though, the best person in this is Tim Thomerson. Yes, he's great. Um, there were two times where I laughed. The first time is when you saw a teddy bear humping somebody's leg. Okay, that was funny, and I don't remember the second time. I have two. But, I have. I had like maybe, two. I noted as well, okay. and they're both kind of towards the end. It's uh, when they're at that theater, and Tim Thomerson sitting next to the girl, and he, and she, he goes, "Have I told you you look lovely tonight?" And she goes, "No." He goes, "That's because I hate women." That was the third time. <laughs> so what was the he, second? His, del- this- his delivery is hilarious. Yes. So, okay. So in the, I'm going to build this one so people listening can understand. So there's Doctor Jackal, who's this prude whatever he's got a nice girl he dates or whatever blah 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 then he like turns into hide and that guy goes on a like like he just goes pounding all night like uh he finds this girl and just like it's sex city for this guy like all you know and he falls off the building or something at the end and like he's laying there and he's got kind of both personalities within him and both oh, girls, yeah, yeah, yeah. both girls kind of meet up at the end and the girlfriend goes, she's like, you, you know him? She goes, know him. This guy ravages me every night. I thought it was kind of funny. Well, uh, and, and 
in a better movie, I would give it credit for the ideas that by the end of the movie, the Burnett, it sort of represents his, you know, carnivorous, you know, his sexually, you know, carnivorous side is more envious of the version that's sweet and wholesome and, and whatever, right. while his, you know, upper crust, uptown girl, blonde fiance is jealous of the version that's a sex machine. Right, right, right. And I, I will say, like, Tim Somerson plays a gay man in it, and it's like, there's laughs with it, but I feel like it's done in for, especially for this time, yeah. a more respectful, like commanding way that kind of treats him with respect yes. about it and gives him power with it um, more than in, in his, you get to watch his journey of his realization of it. Oh, the second part where I laughed, it's also toward the end when they're handing out the Nobel prizes mm -hmm. and one of the prizes given for, and this is obviously a line delivery. You have to be there, but it's like, you know, invented a weapon that can completely eradicate human life without harming any vegetation. <laughs> so, yeah, um, you throw a thousand things at the wall. Something's going to yeah. stick. Um, I, and it does make that weird. It goes to black and white in the end for a bit. Yes. That's kind of interesting. It feels like you're watching a screener because it's not really artistically done. It's just black and white. <laughs> like you know it doesn't like transition into it anything it just it almost needs to like um property of something something studios right at the bottom it kind of jumps it changes like like that like those old screeners would do um but yeah i know this movie just ooh, like i was kind of interested because i remember this vhs box uh from the video store mm -hmm. and i never watched it. i remember this title being like i just not appealing for some reason. It looked like a trashy movie because it had like one of those low rent video companies put it out. So like there, it was one of those. I remember the, it didn't show you any pictures from the movie on it. There was like the box and then the back had another drawing and then just a description like in like a, that font that I'm like, I just didn't trust. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> what am I going to get when I pop this in? You know, like it just was like not the mystery I wanted solved. It was one of those. But I remember that because i was into monsters and stuff i'm like jacqueline hyde well i don't want to laugh at dr jackal mr hyde i want to be scared by Jack dr jackal mr hyde that i was a stupid kid back then <laughs> but, but well, I, I remember what's interesting this, is yeah the film came about because everybody thought there was about to be a writer's strike in 1981 ah, and it plays like uh, that that makes yeah. Some sense yeah and you know at the time the studio heads you know at Paramount, Michael Eisner and Barry Diller, who of course went on to Fortune and Glory, both mm -hmm. there and elsewhere, picked out a handful of low-budget comp pictures so they could have something in the can should a strike occur. Mm -hmm. And Michael Eisner picked this one, along with Samuel Fuller's White Dog. Mm. I don't know if, if listeners have ever heard of Samuel Fuller's White Dog, but it's worth your time. It's a film about white supremacists who, who basically program... I mean, condition a dog to attack black people. Hmm. Um, it is, if this needs to be clarified, it is not a pro racism film. Paul Winfield is the is the protagonist, uh, and Sam Fuller was not a fan of bigotry. Um, but it's it's one of those just I can't believe this got made pictures. It's actually very good. Gotcha. Um, were they like, were they like, we need to get this Mark Blankfield star vehicle out there yes, now. We clearly. have to strike while he's hot. Um, and I don't know which screenplays Don Simpson chose because that's not listed in this trivia page. Um, but anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, this, this poor girl, this uh, Bess Armstrong, she, her next oh, big God. role, she'd land the next year, Jaws 3D. Like, oh, it's, it's not going good for you, girl. It's not. This is uh, uh, Erickson and uh, Krista Erickson who plays the 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 quote unquote you know if you're doing virgin whore dynamic here, mm -hmm. she's the whore. I mean that with all due respect. Right. Uh, she went on to do. I actually saw her in a couple things. Oh, she was in Twenty One Jump Street. And oh, was uh, she his girlfriend that gets killed in the one scene in the one episode? Uh, I don't know. Am I know. thinking of something completely different? I don't know. And she did um, some. She did a little, a uh, couple episodes stint on nine hundred two and zero for a bit. Um, but um, uh, yeah. Um, didn't yeah, do I don't, much. Yeah, no. But she's good in this film. Yeah, she's very. She's up. Everybody gives it their all. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not a badly acted picture in any no. way, shape, or form. Everybody tried it's to make this work. Not yeah. a good film. Yeah, it's not there on paper, and they they can't salvage it with their comedy chops. Like I, I mean, Tim, yeah, like, Tim Thomas, I'm a big fan of anyway. Like he's always, in inter- I mean, it, it's crazy. Like B movies. He's going to be a name over the title. And then in a picture stuff, he's like sidebar, maybe he gets put on the name on the poster, but he did the transfer series over at full moon features, which I like. Um, he's got a, he's got an interesting presence every time he's there. He's got this like over, he's like this uh, overconfident oaf all the time. And he's, he's super funny when he's, when he's in things, but yeah, this is not a good one. Uh, just, is just, I, I guess we should feel fortunate. We laughed like almost can count it on one hand times, right? Like <laughs> three laughs. I'll take as it. Garbage as some of these can be where we don't even laugh. I guess we'll give that's, that's how bottom of the barrel we are this week. Um, But you know, who wasn't in the bottom of the barrel was Casey Kasem with the top 40. Casey Kasem. Thank you and hello again, everybody. Welcome to America's Top 10. Let's get right to the action on the Billboard Pop Singles Chart and check out the 10 biggest popular songs in America this week. Um, this week, all right, our last Top 40. Uh, number 10, stay in there. Paul McCartney, take it away. Number 9, Wasted on the Way Again. Crosby, Stills, Nash. Vacation from the Go-Go staying at number 8. Holy crap. Number 7, Keep the Fire Burning, Ario Speedwagon. Number six, even the nights are better. Air supply. Number five, hard to say. This is, we have the same top ten as last week. So number four, hold me, Fleetwood <laughs> Mac. Number three, Abracadabra by the Steve Miller Band. Number two, Hurt So Good by John Cougar. And number one again for the six week straight, Eye the Tiger by Survivor. But that that rain, at least right here, will come to an end as the week after this, the Steve Miller Band with abracadabra would hit number one but in our last week yeah we had the exact same top 10 as last week so that's just this way this week on the show has been to finish out not the prettiest finish here uh moving to our final film scott of the summer of 82 at 40 the final film and you know what the title's fun because for this series we had to do a lot of homework that's my last segue you like that no you've done better okay you know that i had to buy a special frying pan for sheila she didn't want one that had been used to cook meat oh yeah and today i learned how to cook a soybean patty (laughs) if i told her that she had to eat a soybean patty she'd be filing charges against me with a child abuse suit you know i hate starch shirts hurry up george Ready to kill for a steak. Sheila? Sheila? What? We're going. Your, uh, whatever it is, is in the fridge. Anybody use my soybean patty? No, nobody has touched it. I had to hide it from Dad, though. He wanted to feed it to the cat. Mother, not funny. <laughs> it's just a joke, Sheila. Uh, directed by James Bashirs, written by Morris Peterson, Dance and Don Safran, starring... And I'm going to tell you how they tell it. <laughs> Starring Joan Collins, Michael Morgan, Shell Kepler, Larry Horn, Wings Hauser. Finally, we got our Wings Hauser picture and Aaron Donovan. Good looking, but virginal rock star teen Tommy tries to score with some of the local high school girls. But a classmate's mom decides to make a man out of him. Not really till the end, but okay. So uh, this Bashir's guy, this is the only film he did, but he is a sound ADR supervisor editor for like major films, like big time things. And he was the post-production exec on Kung Fu Panda, Scott as well as Shrek the third and flushed away. So he had a stint at DreamWorks for a bit. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Joan Collins here. Um, She, I mean, okay. Joan Collins is like this big name, big name, big name, big name. And growing up, I'm always like, why, what did she do? What? 
it's got to, it's primarily dynasty, right? Scott, is that what made yes. John Collins, Joe Collins? Cause she's in stuff, but I'm like, what is it? Like, was she just like something like pre social media, just tabloids Her love quote unquote participation in this picture. Yeah. Was because of dynasty becoming a big deal. Well, she did it before. And she, I yeah, think she shot a very small supporting part. I don't know that wonder what circumstances. And then after dynasty became six, allegedly they we got a film with her in it yeah and that's something that happens a lot mm -hmm. you know it, it's where you got you know adam sandler you know makes a two-scene cameo in some film and then five years later when he's a superstar yep. it's put out on VHS uh, overboard was that the one yeah. yeah that was the one i was thinking of yeah yeah you, you, um, yeah they would put them on the box prominently featured and they'd show up in the back like uh andy yeah. kaufman in uh god told me to when he plays like this extra street police officer that gets a close-up so there's, there's controversy a, here with this film there is a horror film starring crispin glover as a you know murderer you know one of those guys that you know lives with his mother and hacks up teen simon says okay came out in 2006 it's not good by any sense of the word but it is a film that heavily advertised the presence of blake lively she gets mm. second billing on the on the poster she's on the poster she is in the uh epilogue oh wow she is in the movie for maybe 30 seconds oh, uh, it actually stars margot hirschman mm. who was probably best known for playing uh, donnie on the disney channel show even stevens okay uh, she did some time on ncis as well well we have some um, we have some controversy about this because of what they did after getting joe collins and shine to speak spruce this up a bit um similar to Paradise, which opened this uh, summer of A2 for you. So the day before the film's premiere, uh, Joan Collins, Betty Thomas, Carrie Snodgrass, and Lee Purcell all took legal action to get their names removed from the credits of this movie. Collins claimed that the film's advertising was misleading because she had only performed in a minor supporting role shot two years earlier. But a sex scene had been added afterward using a body double to cash in on her new celebrity status from the hit TV show Dynasty. Uh, the other three performers claimed they had been under a false impression about the kind of film they were making. Uh, Collins' attorneys won a partial victory when a federal court ordered Jensen Farley Pictures to stop using ads that depicted Collins nude. Because there's this one where the guy's butts there. And she's like, oh, my God, my shirt's off. He's going up the seam from the ladder, but they made it look like her shirt was off. Um, so, Scott, your thoughts on homework. Our last movie for the summer of 1982 looks and feels and plays like a no budget porn from 1972. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I'm this no has been the summer of 82 of 40, the end. <laughs> Cliffhanger. Um, no, that's the summer. That's a different summer, Scott. <laughs> Touche. Um, we should do I that mean, summer and just yeah. end it, end it with that movie, like, and stop. <laughs> Super Mario Brothers killed us, the end. <laughs> um, same weekend. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, this is garbage. There's no there there. This is in basically what we all kind of wrongly, or at least me, I wrongly thought films like Zapped or, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank here. What are some of the other teen sex comedies? We had Last movie? American Virgin, Fast Times. Last American Virgin, Virgin. High, yeah. yeah. Obviously, I was expecting Fast Times to be a perfectly fine movie because it has a good reputation. Right. And I'm not saying Zapped was good, but it was. Oh, God, it's it Fast was, Times it compared to this. Yeah, it, yeah, it's not homework. This film is a giant nothing burger. I mean, there's, there's, it looks gross. I don't mean gross as an oh no vulgarity. I mean, it looks like it's shot on a Betamax camera smeared with, with dirty Vaseline. Um, <laughs> it's badly acted. It's badly staged. Nothing happens of note. Mm -hmm. It's just a garbage film. Yeah. You know, I know I've said several times, this may be the worst film we've watched. Well, we saved the worst for last. <laughs> <laughs> Grease 2 looks like fucking airspray compared to this. Right. Yeah. Um, this, this is bad. This, this is like, I didn't care. Like, and it has some just, it's got Wings Hauser in it. So that should tell you one thing. Like, that guy is, like, if he's, that's not a sign of quality. But, uh, I mean, he has Spice Squad. That's probably his best 
movie he's in. I can't remember anything else. <laughs> but sorry, Wings. Uh, but man, this has some like t- it's full of like nudie daydreams, fantasy sequences, and they're just like dumb. Like there's the rock one where you just stand there, and girls are just rubbing and stripping around him. Um, it's got it's just some gross ideas to it, and I don't know, man. This is like critics at the beginning of this year are like losing their mind about Porky's. I'm like, this is what you should have feared. Yeah. This is not, this is what you think Porky's is. And you lost your mind over it. <laughs> and, and because you did, and then it gets popular, people churn this out, but this was shot two years earlier. So I you suppose can you can't. Yeah. It does not look like it's from 82. It does no, definitely it's, it's... reeks of the seventies. Um, and it's gross. Like, it's just gross. Like, it's not like porn's like more tantalizing than this. Like, it's, I, 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 don't, I have no idea what was going on. And there's a bunch of these movies that come out in the 80s. Like, there's like private school and like, there's that one with Phoebe Cates and uh, what's his, uh, Harmon, I think. Um, there's that, oh, I love when sleep with my teacher type movies. This, I, I don't know. Um, and the Collins seems ridiculous, the one she's mad about. Um, cause yeah, they, they don't even shoot cleverly to make it a body double, but I mean, um, yeah, this is just the poster would make you think, Oh, I did. I miss a, this movie. Is this like a lost <laughs> gem? Like, cause it's got a quality poster for its time. And then you're like, ah, Nope, no. Um, Gene Siskel said of the movie, he gave it zero stars out of four, which is being kind. If you're asking me. <laughs> He declaring a miserable excuse for a movie, one of the year's worst. Dave Pollack said in the Los Angeles Times that the film was marred by poor photography, sloppy editing, and atrocious acting, and the body double in the sex scene doesn't even resemble Collins. Outrage. I'm mad. I want to at least simulate it. <laughs> yeah. I want to be able to believe my eyes, damn it. How am I supposed oh. to touch myself to this? I'm the suspension of disbelief. Come on. Oh. Number 82 at 40. There are several other movies I su- could suggest for that, but I don't want to get canceled on the last show. Right. I just but assure it, you, none of them are E.T. Yeah. I, this is just, I don't, I don't have anything good to say about this movie no. at all. Like, it's junk. It doesn't even, it's not even filmed. Like, uh, this guy was working and stuff and this is what he does. It's, I mean, it doesn't even feel like TV good like no. <laughs> directorially wise. And it's no, but no actor has any kind of charisma or whatever to bring it. Not even Collins in the moment she's in, like she's it's not even good for her. Like it's, it's just, this is just bad. This is what, this is one of the, I don't, it's on our brain right now. This is one of the worst movies we've done for this whole thing. Easily, oh yeah, without easily, question. without question, it's bad. Um, it's it's so bad, partially because there's nothing to talk about. Yeah, the nudity's not even good. The the sex scenes aren't even good. Like I can't even talk about like, well, that was pretty hot, or that was good. No, there's just someone who doesn't know how to tantalize. Like it's it's super male gazy because it's like just right, just take off the top. That's all we need, right? No, there's no art to it. There's no. Uh, yeah, it's definitely done from male perspective, one hundred percent. But man, it's just—it's also really, really boring. Yep, snoozer. So, yep. So if you think, "Ooh, this sounds you know hot and bothery," it's not. Am I? Got, yeah, like it even really the, isn't. Even the kids that snuck this one in at the rental store were disappointed when they it's got like, home. Fuck this! Let's go see ET again. Fuck oh, yeah! Oh my gosh, this is oh, oh. Let's let's move on from homework. This is. I'm sorry we ended our last movie is this, but fuck. Uh, speaking of, what, what happened to the box office this weekend? What did oh. they, they, they did sneak into ET, didn't they, Scott? They did sneak into ET, absolutely, with six point six million dollars in its twelfth weekend, a drop of thirteen point seven percent, still playing in seventeen hundred screens for a two hundred twenty seven point five million dollar domestic total. Officer and a gentleman back up the number two with 5.6 million 
going up 5.2%, gaining 178 screens for a 980 screen or 980 screens for a $33.9 million total after the end of five weekends. Friday the 13th Part 3 in 3D dropped 46%, lost 166 screens, made 2.9 million for a 25 million 17 day total. Last little whole, excuse me, the best little whore house in Paris. Best, but not last. <laughs> 2.3 million, dropping 21%, remaining in over a thousand screens for a $57.2 million total at the end of six weekends. The Beastmaster in its second weekend dropped 25%, earning $2.228 million. Not bad. Uh, no, that's fine. Yeah, for a $6.9 million 10 day total. Fast times at Ridgemont High, moving up a spot into sixth place with $2 million, dropping 20%, um, for a $10.2 million 17 day total. The world, according to GARP, sticking around uh, 1.6 million, minus 15%, 20 million bucks at the end of weekend six. And then the Road Warrior, which inexplicably came back to like 675 screens last yeah. weekend. Uh, earned another 1.56 million, dropping 39%, uh, bringing its total to 19.1 million at the end of 15 weekends. Back when 20 and, million could be good, you know? And back in the top 10 after back. momentarily dropping to 12 plays is Rocky 3. Not down for the count. Nope. Nope. Got up. Uh, it found its eye of the tiger oh. and came back to the top 10. Yeah. No. Rising up to the yeah, challenge of a rival. Um, 1.55 million, dropping 13%, remaining in 848 screens after 14 weekends in theaters for $108.8 million. And then top t- to top off the top 10, Homework, the only new release in the top 10. Yeah, which, uh, to be fair, uh, Jacqueline Hyde Together Again was actually, I threw it in here because I thought it'd be fun to, to throw some stuff, but it was a San you Francisco, o- it was a San Francisco only release. It would release uh, wide uh, either end of September or beginning of October. You mean we watched that when we didn't have to? I just had to throw it in. <sighs> you laughed three times. You would have rather watched that than homework. True. But you forgot about homework until just this morning. Nobody knows that. <laughs> so I watched them both today. Triple features. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> okay. 1.366 million, uh, 262 theaters, which a $5,000, $215, excuse me, $5,215 per screen average. For 1.366 million, it would eventually earn a whopping too much point nine million dollars. Wow, a, that's more well, than it should have. Yeah, it shouldn't. It's not going to stick around. No, nope. and that's it for the top ten. Star Wars got knocked out. Um, yes, and I noticed. Can this franchise be saved? Sneaky bastard. Six pack keeps making like a cool like 1.3 million like every week. 1.3 to 1.6. It keeps. Keeps picking that up. So that's the yeah. Kenny Rogers one, right? Yep. Yep. Kenny Rogers and kids uh, <laughs> riding around. All right, Scott, this is it. This is the end. We made it through the summer of 82. Before. We've watched every movie that came out that summer, wide release, North America, whatever. Uh, some smaller ones in there in between. All right. We're at the end. So overall thoughts on the summer of 82. Now that we've been through it all from rear view. Looking at it. Well, there are obviously going to be some films that by default are the kind of, we don't see this in theaters or really even in streaming much anymore. Films like Young Doctors in Love and The World According to Garp. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, even Night Shift, which was somewhat famous for being, you know, Ron Howard's directorial debut and Michael Keaton's breakout role, et cetera, et cetera. And that goes into something I've been whining about for a while. And I'm sure I'm not alone, which is that, you know, one of the problems with, Hollywood's failure to cultivate new movie stars is you don't get those kind of films at the mainstream theatrical level. I mean, you can talk all you want about trying to make the next Tom Cruise, but Tom Cruise became a star from films like Risky Business and yes, Top Gun, but also films like The Color of Money, Born on Fourth of July and Jerry Maguire. Those films barely exist 
at the theatrical or streaming level. So where are these stars going to break out? You know, casting them in, you know, variations of legend, which was one of Tom Cruise's only flops for the first 30 years or so, you know, that's not going to cut it. You know, I'm shocked that Taylor Kitts didn't become a star from John Carter. Uh -huh. Headland didn't become a star from Tron Legacy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all due respect. Um, and Rocky Three still holds up as sort of the, the definitive Rocky movie. Mm -hmm. Not the best Rocky movie, mind you, but the one that most represents what the franchise means to most people, casual and hardcore fans. It is obviously the, the film whose formula was most often copied slash ripped off, where you have the the you know the triumphant hero that's laid low by a scary new hungry rival, and then he has to find his heart and soul again to take back what it's his. You know, you can, you know, everything from the Dark Knight Rises to you know Star Trek Beyond. Uh, Cars three, et cetera. You know, a lot of threequels for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. You know, Iron Man three, um, even Thor Ragnarok to a certain extent. You know, you take away his hammer, you take away his hair, you take away his god powers, and what is he? Um, anyway, um, watching Firefox and Officer and Gentleman was fascinating yeah. in relation to how both films, you know, were sort of top gun for adults. Which, in a skewed way, explains one reason why the original Top Gun was as successful as it was, is it was those films, but kid friendly yeah. and more to the MTV generation. Um, again, I'm amused that Sword and Sorcerer basically made about as much money as Conan the Barbarian. Right. Despite having no cultural footprint whatsoever. Outdid the Beastmaster. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, more than doubled it. I mean, you know, it outgrossed Blade Runner by a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, and the thing, and like, yeah, all, yeah, yeah. All it's, these films that we hold up as sort of, you know, geek milestones, and then we wonder why the sequels and reboots don't make money. Mm -hmm. All due respect. Um, let's see. You know, I, I want. I pointed it out in an earlier episode, but like, yeah, the musical was alive and well in the summer in '82. Yeah. Um, and that's something I did not expect because we had a musical every, I mean, we couldn't go a couple weeks without something like a musical, uh, even some weeks having multiple ones. And then like horror was not present much at all. Like we had a couple of big ones uh, that, which I think allowed Poltergeist to kind of dominate its first challenger was the thing which bombed. So Poltergeist just kept going until Friday yeah. the 13th showed up when Friday the 13th showed up, it was gone. It, like it, it finally, was dropping out of the, the box office top 10. It didn't have, it had like no competition. Like that's why I don't know. I think it's a great movie. It's got Spielberg's name on it. It was, it's, it's awesome. It still holds up and plays well today. It's a great movie. That's probably why, but it's lasting power and the money it made that it did probably had the assist from nobody going to the thing. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's aside from the fact, you know, it's a very good movie that was sold mm -hmm. as, you know, from the guy that directed Jaws and the guy that directed Texas Chainsaw Massacre mm -hmm. teaming up to scare the shit out of you. Yeah. Um, just as, you know, the previous year was the guy that made Jaws and the guy that made Star Wars coming up to, you know, you know, the ultimate adventure picture. Right. I, I think, you know, the initial tagline is like the return of the great adventure or something yes. like that. Mm -hmm. Um Speaking of which, by default, the best movies of the summer were Star Wars, Raiders, E.T., and Poltergeist. <laughs> uh, two of those were reissues from the Spielberg Lucas farm. Oh. Um, I, I would have to throw Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan in there, sir. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I won't belittle. I, I like Star Trek 2 quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's not my favorite Star Trek is only because I like there's a couple others I like better, even better. And I'm, I'm uh, a Blade Runner. No, I'm, I'm going to piss Blade off Runner Nicholas. And, oh, yeah, that too, of course. And uh, Thing, too, as well. Those yeah. Big, I'm big on um, those. But I and, and another thing, too, the movies that we already knew were good were good. Yeah. They were great. They're, I mean, even, you know, they're even better to watch. The movies that were notoriously bad were bad. The movies mm -hmm. that had been forgotten we hadn't heard of were mostly bad. Yeah. And there was um, a reason. I mean, there wasn't a lot. I want to talk about surprises that you found in this, um, but I'm like, I'm looking I back. Mean, I'm like, there's nothing I was. Oh, it's a new favorite. Or that there are a few that I enjoyed. Just like I'm not gonna say Young Doctors in Love was good. No, yeah, because it wasn't. Stick with me. Like, but 
Yeah. I might give it a chance way down the road again. But I enjoyed seeing all of those actors when they were very, very young Mm -hmm. in this, you know, romantic comedy farce, whatever. Right. Um, And, you know, a lot of those, you know, Corbin Burnson is someone that I don't necessarily associate with being a heartthrob, Mm -hmm. but he is a romantic lead in that picture. Yeah. Um, And yeah, you know, if I may indulge my lechery for a second, John Young wearing a doctor's outfit with glasses. (laughs) Yeah, I'll take that over homework, all due respect. Right. Um, I I thought... um... Yeah, there like so there were some that weren't good, but they're gonna stick. Like summer lovers, not that, that great, was interesting. But, like it was interesting, and and it had a killer soundtrack. It's one of those killer soundtrack movies that we don't talk about the killer soundtrack, and it had a yeah. number one hit from the movie. Chicago's number only number one hit, and it's an interesting movie. Um, that that'll stick. It'll live in my mind for a bit. I'll remember that one. And like yeah, young doctors in love not strong but it's like oh man this is a really good try it was yeah. a, it was a really good try and having not seen it in a while i was amused at how much i enjoyed denman door played before yes. it started going into all the cameos yeah yeah Denman i think the first that's act one my, worked on its own yeah that's one of my favorites from here that i wasn't probably talking about as much beforehand uh we i last american virgin i i believe you i i always enjoyed that one but i was happy to have you yeah. uh enjoy it as well Fine. um tex that was a that was terrific. That might be the best one we found. Yeah, that none um, either of us watched. I had heard of it, but I had never seen it. Yeah, just because that that author is a blind spot for me. Yeah, I thought um, there was the challenge was better than I uh, I thought that was the the uh, Scott oh yeah, Glenn yeah the one. Scott Glenn one. I like that one um, a bit. Um, but even that, like on paper, that looks like I'll probably enjoy that, and I yeah. did. Yeah. Uh, there were a few that, like you know, the Gene Wilder comedy that was garbage. Yeah, I wanted that. Uh, I, like, I wanted to like. I went I'm in probably like, going to enjoy this. Like, I did not enjoy this. No, not good. Um, yeah, World According to Garp was like the most depressing thing in the world. We uh, knew that going in. We did. Um, yeah, um, it's and that's a film that you know, and I, I had seen it many many years ago. Is that the film from 1982 that looks like it could have been shot last year in terms of the quality of the image and the the you know, the, the depth of, of, you know, the, the quality of the, the yeah. I mean, it, it looks rich and deep in a way that a lot of early eighties films don't. Um, and that's not even a criticism of those. It's just, you know, whatever. Um, Night Shift was a lot of fun and having not seen it, I didn't realize that, that Michael Keaton was not the lead, that he was sort of the firecracker supporting character. What were some of the, Let's talk about we talk about some of the things we like, some of the things that kind of worked. What were like the pits of do of this? It's the worst. The pits, the worst. That wasn't okay. homework or any of the tiles this week that we already just people clearly well, uh, know we didn't like. Obviously, those. Grease 2 is still terrible, all due respect. Right. Not every infamously bad, bad movie demands a critical evalu- reevaluation, proclaiming that it is good, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, there are some films for and by women and not a white guy people that perhaps were unduly derided in their time, but Grease 2 ain't one of them. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm going to throw... pirate movie was freaking terrible. That was a bad week with Cheech and Chonks. Things are tough all over. Oh, yeah, that was pirate movie. abysmal. Jesus. Yeah. Ooh. Um, let's see. That movie called Raiders of the Lost Ark they were released. What in the hell? Ooh, yeah, nah. that's a knockoff of Alan Quarterman. They should sue. Yep. Oh, yeah. No, that was... Um, hmm. And I'm sorry, the, the new Hope thing, if I want to watch Flash Gordon, I'll fucking watch Flash Gordon. Right. What the heck? Um, oh. Yeah, I. Yeah, that was... Th- those. That was some of the pits. Uh, like, you know what? It, it's weird because we started, like, thinking, like, oh, well, Paradise sucks. Paradise, I don't even know it's going to fall in the top five worst. Uh. It'll it's be gonna, there. It's yeah, gonna, it's yeah. gonna it's gonna be in the bracket, but like, yeah. Ooh, like I mean, geez. it's a. F- it, I think it's more, and yeah, it's also kind of boring. But I think it's more offensive, bad than like poorly made. If mm-hmm. that makes sense. That that horror movie from the Night of the Living Dead guy was bad. Oh, geez, that was that was that's in the top five. That was bad. Ralph Julia had a horrible summer. Yeah. Uh, uh he really did. Yeah. He had a bad oh. summer. Um. Oh. 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 The the slasher. The death screams. Ugh. <laughs> Agreed. Those are some of the uh, Annie never did anything for me then. No. Annie's a yeah big budget like oh. law. Um. 
I oh. really enjoyed rediscovering the best little whorehouse in Texas. Yes. I I thought the uh, wrong is right was fascinating. Yes, that was not good, I, but fascinating. It's very, yeah, very interesting. That's one that I sort of accidentally saw it many, many years ago, just in happenstance. Otherwise, I probably never would have heard of it. Yeah. Um, and Officer and Gentleman still kicks ass. Yeah, that was a, Again, that was a blind spot filled. And I'm like, yeah, that was a great movie. That's another one that feels like, you know, in comparison to a mid 80s movie, it's sort of the adult, earlier adult version of Dirty Dancing in that it's a, mm-hmm. you know, a drama about class and economic mobility and, and personal identity, blah, 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 that in the last five minutes turns into somewhat more of a wish fulfillment fantasy. Yeah. 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 And that's OK. And it earns it. Yeah, it earns it. Yes, and it absolutely. actually fits the narrative and what they want yes. to do in the movie. And not all movies need to end dark and unhappy. Yeah. Some people can fix their lives. Yeah, that's really what it is. He fixed the, they fix them. Both they fix of them. each other. They fix each other. Uh, the mother um, comes through with things. You know, it, and again, it's 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 like Pretty Woman many years later. You know, eight years later, it's a reverse Cinderella story where the, you know, misbegotten princess saves the prince. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but not uh, Keith David. <laughs> or David Keith, David Keith, the other one. <laughs> Whoops. Um, that's okay. Uh, yeah. I and you know what might be. You know, we started off. We didn't think it gets better. My cult classic of this of the of the eighty two Safari three thousand. The Christopher oh, Lee. That was interesting. I mean, it was fine, but like, it was, it was, if there's one that I'm like, you know what? All right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's on the, the dvd box by the way harmless you know what <laughs> all right harmless 80 minutes some racing stuff some zinger one-liners christopher lee hamming up Starker yeah Chance that's which is working. not something i see all that much yeah so i was like you know what i could i could i could yeah. rate that as the cult classic and but- i don't even remember the name of it but i genuinely enjoyed the corbin picture that first week yeah oh yeah yeah that's right uh, uh forbidden world Yes. What, Scott, oh, uh, what, what, um, I wanted to ask you this one before we round this out. So what are some pre- preconceived notions about this era, this summer, this period versus the actual reality we just went through that might have uh, opened your eyes to it? Um, or, you know, I don't want to say none because that makes me sound like an arrogant bastard. Yeah. Um, but I will just, it's sort of a reminder that. Even 40 years ago, we had a full slate of movies and not everything broke out. And the many of the preordained hits towered over the quote unquote studio programmers, even though, you know, what qualified as a quote unquote tentpole and what was just a studio programmer differed 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, today, you know, obviously, officer and gentleman would be lucky to be counter programming. Um, Seaford of Nymph was a film that I admired more than really enjoyed. Yeah. So I sort of had a preconceived notion that it was is this of its time masterwork that was, you know, gonna cat, should have cat, catapulted Dean Bluth, Don Bluth to the top. And again, I love Don Bluth. I love American Tale, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you one thing I thought Friday the 13th was one of the three was one of the good ones, and it is not. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> by default, I mean, you know. I am not a huge fan of the Friday the 13th franchise overall, but I always kind of assumed that the second, third, and fourth, and then the sixth were the quote unquote good ones. We actually watched the third one for this, and then we watched, I think, four and five just out of curiosity. Uh, five, I admire what it was trying to do. It's a do sleaze masterpiece. Yeah. It's a sleaze masterpiece. Four is basically all about the last 20 minutes. Well, no, four, four is the one that if you're going to show someone one Jason movie and you want it to be the scary one, that's it. That's you, fair. You don't need to see everything. I'll tell you what, there is nothing that I, you know, again, I don't, have a, I don't have a photographic memory of those pictures. But for me, there's nothing scarier in any of the Friday the 13th movies than Corey Feldman basically mutilating himself to look like Jason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, that I, is a genuinely frightening, disturbing image. I, I think one of the things, too, uh, with this summer that comes across is like, the preconceived notions versus the reality is some of these movies that have legacies that they were this big hit. They weren't that big or they were just hidden like Conan. 
not that big a hit. Yeah. It wasn't that huge. Um, and I think, and you know, there, there's two movies that this summer got wrong. And we've known that the thing blade runner, that's fine, but we've also proven the audience isn't that large in its legacy, even that want to see more or anything like that. Um, but I think there's a, a thing where, especially with genre stuff in these solid hits or something that, um, just because you can market, uh, shirts, um, books, expanded universe extensions or art or figures doesn't mean people are going to that movie or want more of that movie. They just like buying the cool stuff from that movie. Doesn't mean it may have to be a franchise, maybe in like the case of like a Conan or something like, you know, like I think there's a difference between buying the merch from a movie and then wanting more from that movie or going to the next one or big, the audience is for that. I don't know. I I agree with you. And I also think, and again, I may be speaking incorrectly here, but I think that a company can make a profit selling mugs and T-shirts and action figures of a cult, of a geek property, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the, there's enough money and or audience out there to justify a fifty to hundred million dollar movie. And I'm going to say this, and I'm probably going to get skewered, yeah. but Star Wars isn't what it is because just dorks went and saw it. Oh, of course. Everybody yeah. loves Star Wars. There's one period where it's dork. It's right coming soon, 84 to 98. Yeah. And you could argue maybe 97. But yeah. but even the, Spaceballs kept it around. That I mean, that's that's the only period where Star Wars is in the rear view window and you're just like holding on. You're you're buying expanded universe novels, comics, <laughs> board games, video like it's gone it's it's something old Blah, you're you're hanging on to it like people did with star trek as a television show in the 70s that's where you're at and Isn't that great yeah and <laughs> honestly you had three movies that basically everybody loved it told a complete story and that was all you needed maybe sometimes we should move up. maybe we shouldn't poke fun at expanded universe stuff as not being the real there's so just let it go let that be it for people because yeah. It's not pissing off a mass. Some people, if you're there to enjoy, if you want more stories, sorry, you might have to read. <laughs> and no, and it's it's a uh, Darren Mooney had a piece just this morning. He said, I say, even though people are going to listen to this two months from now, mm -hmm. about how you know a lot of the, you know, this isn't a shocker, but you know nothing's allowed to be old anymore because nothing's allowed to go away. Yeah, and here's the thing: we we have Star Wars show up again here in this summer towards the end just to make a couple like five extra million dollars that's what the dorks brought that's yeah. that's not hundreds of millions of hundreds of millions of dollars is ever your grandma going to star wars and going let's go see it again you know it's the um, normies franchise i'm sorry you're not everybody fucking loves star wars that's why whenever i talk about film geek conversations film cover like let's just put it up here we all love Star Wars. What else do you like? Where's your where do you go from there? What else do you like? We all we all like Star Wars. You don't need to talk about that. We have our own personal and Star Wars is something you have your own personal relationship with. There you go. What else you got? You know, what what else do you go from there? We all it you know, and because everybody likes Star Wars. Well, and that's with every major franchise of that nature. And you know this. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's you know, Lord of the Rings was a gajillion dollar success because of people that had never had barely heard of the novels that thought right. the movies were cool. Yeah. And liked the characters, Aragons, uh, uh, Legolas, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a bunch of Tolkien nerds all coming out in full force. Right. Obviously, they showed up, but you don't get to 800 million worldwide, 900 million worldwide, and then 1.1 billion worldwide and the gajillion Oscars from the nerds. You know, it's it's it's, you know, Ant-Man in 2015 was a hit precisely because the people that had never heard of Edgar Wright and didn't care about that melodrama mm -hmm. showed up because it looked like a fun Marvel movie. And maybe they like Paul Rudd. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's I think that's and I might write about this and 
by the time this airs, maybe I will have written about this. You know, that was the one really awful legacy of Batman and Robin, a film that I do not hate, even though I don't think it's a good film, which is that it, it, it tricked Hollywood into thinking that the geeks could actually affect the commercial result for these gajillion dollar pictures. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sorry, Ain't It Cool News did not sink Batman and Robin. Right. It opened with $44 million. It then dropped 64% because audiences didn't like it. It had casting decisions and a trailer that they made their mind up about real early on. And it lived up to that when people saw it that opening yeah. weekend. Yeah. And, you know, if, if audiences liked it, they would have shown up at weekend two, three, four, and five. Mm-hmm. But audiences, general moviegoers, did not like what they saw for whatever reason. And they went and saw something else. It wasn't because of Ain't It Cool News. It wasn't because, because of, and these are, you know, whatever sites, you know, Coming Attractions, Dark Horizons. I read all of these at that yeah, age. Yeah, yep. I was, and that's yeah. fine. But, you know, it's the idea that they were kingmakers was sort of the start of this hell that we're at now where, you know, every gajillion dollar property acts like they're being held hostage by the geeks. Taking over Com- San Diego Comic Con, all that, yeah. Um, and some of those geeks are wonderful people who, you know, can make those properties a part of their identity without it completely overtaking them. And frankly, some of those people are just garden variety racists and bigots who happen to hop from one IP to another, spreading filth on the internet just for the hell of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And I say this a lot because it's a huge problem. We need to stop treating them like serious people who deserve to be at the table. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're 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 trolls. They're they're pranksters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. I always say when when you when people band together and stuff like, who are you? Do you know who you're standing with? You agree on one thing here, <laughs> one thing. And who is that? Per- why do you agree? Because someone might be like, there's that troll waiting. There's that person who just hates anything to do with it. And you just didn't like this one part. So they're with you and you're like, yeah. And then they also <laughs> vote for genocide of races. Yep. Oop, you know, like that's. And again, the, the, the general audiences look, the last Jedi is my favorite star Wars movie. The rise of Skywalker is my least favorite star Wars movie. I will all but guarantee that the vast majority of audiences that saw both of those thought they were fine whatever good time saw them once or mm-hmm. twice in theaters maybe took the kids and then barely gave them another thought yep because that's the way the real world works they saw star trek into darkness and thought it was a solid polished big budget sci-fi action adventure picture mm-hmm. they saw iron man 3 and thought it was a really solid fun iron man movie that reminded them a little bit of lethal weapon mm-hmm. you know the yep. the post-release discourse that is often shaped by vocal minorities, some of whom I will argue are often disingenuous, you know, create narratives that are false. Mm -hmm. And and I'm getting off the reservation here, but again, we've just finished talking about a summer where many of the biggest, most successful films of that summer were the ones that can't get made today because the cult bombs took over the pop culture ecosystem. Right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I don't begrudge anyone that loves Blade Runner or loves the thing or loves Tron, but I also won't sit here and argue that it's a good thing that those are the franchises that still get talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the geeks won and everybody else lost. Yeah. Yeah. True, true. There's no more and officer a, and gentlemen's. And now I'm a 42 year old man that has to pretend that I still give a shit. I'm still just as excited for Spider Man No Way Home as I was for Sam Raimi's Spider Man when I was 22 years old. Right. Yep. And yeah. And meanwhile, we don't see Best Little Horror House in Texas, which was yeah. huge. Yeah. <laughs> like, the officer and gentlemen, Best Little House in Texas. You know, uh, 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 Young Doctors in Love, you know, the World According to Garp night shift all Mm -hmm. these films that were just movies it was funny as a movie geek growing up like i always was like waiting till when i got into those movies or i could see those i was watching i like the genre stuff and i did i argued you know people should you know respect the genre stuff as like just just as a piece of the cinema piece of the artist too but i never said you need to replace it with this i i wanted all to see Exactly. All this stuff. And the issue was never that tentpoles dominated the box office. It's that 
there was there, there's no now no longer room for much else yeah. because the audience that used to see the tent poles and the people that used to see spider-man and unfaithful now either see unfaithful at home on streaming or just don't watch it yeah mm-hmm. yeah and again that's something i've been whining about for six or seven years because you know yeah i've seen it happen in slow motion yeah and covid obviously heightened that but that situation existed beforehand um and you know i think you know, late 2001, 2021, a whole slew of big adult skewing dramas and genre films all being released by Fox, by a Disney that didn't seem to care about them, or at least wasn't prioritizing them, certainly did not help. Right. I certainly would never dream to argue that the people that marketed those films didn't, you know, shed blood, sweat, and tears and do everything they could, but, you know, it's, 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 West Side Story being released by an independent Fox Studios would have been a different, you know, would have served a different purpose than one as part of the Disney machine. Yes. And, you know, West Side Story, The Last Duel, uh, uh, Nightmares and, and Nightmare Nightmare Alley. Mm-hmm. Oh, none of these were commercial slam dunks, even in non-COVID times. Right. But the fact that they all you know even like the Fred's dispatch which actually did pretty well for a niche wes anderson picture Mm -hmm. but again i think it's an unfortunate coincidence whatever that these films that were supposed to represent hey look adult films can succeed in theaters too even during covid were mostly all released by a studio with less vested interest than might have been the case a few years ago gotcha yeah. And that's way off the topic. So you could cut that out. All good. Time. All good. No, I love it because we're going from there to now to reflecting things and having some tangents. But yeah, um, the downer note of the end of some Ravidi 204. But no, this was a lot of fun. It was a project I always wanted to do. You were more than happy when I pitched it to you to come on and do it. I, I had that was go- a lie. I didn't want to do it. He didn't. He didn't. I- Wendy said I should because I need to get out more. So you need no, to I'm be- kidding. It was. <laughs> You need to be nice to him, Scott. Um, <laughs> but no, it was fun. I had I enjoy as much as the bad ones were. I enjoy going through this because I'm like, you know what? I can't wait to rip this with Scott. Like <laughs> that's, that's about and honestly. I liked forcing myself to watch older movies that all I needed to do was watch them and kind of talk about them for a few mm-hmm. minutes, where I wasn't writing a review. Yeah, or no thinking dive. about next six weeks of box office. Just a general chit chat about that movie, yeah. like at like we just left the theater to talk about yeah. it. At, at Scott and I used to like to go to a movie and then we go and like get like Scott likes chicken fingers fries somewhere. We go someplace. And that's what you do. You know, some people do it over whiskey, something like that. But I'll tell uh, you that first year or so in California, which was when you were around, mm-hmm. I had a devil of a time finding decent chicken fingers. Right. Right. It wasn't until corals in Burbank. Like you found them. There you go. Um Cores and Burbank brought to you, but um, <laughs> but yeah, so we, I mean, I like the factoids. I like seeing the TV shows bop up and down, see what people were watching, the songs that came at the time. Cause you know, Rocky three comes out. I'm like, where's I the tiger? It's not even in the top 10. And then here it comes later on battling through. So, you know, and being like, Oh crap, that was there this time. Finding out things were huge. Like I didn't know Toto had the Grammy winning album uh, for best album. I didn't know uh, the top selling albums of the year or uh, Asia had the top selling album of the year. Fucking Asia. Their <laughs> song didn't even hit number one. Uh, and, you know, there's big things that happened, like how just how big Mellencamp was when he came out. Like I'm in Indiana, so we always knew in we knew Mellencamp, but just how big his album was looking at the numbers, all the Grammys, all that. It's just like insane. Uh, the realization of some of these things uh, just watching the go-go's turn to no-no's right away. Like they had flash in a pan, huge, these biggest band of the world to gone. Right. At, I mean, they, they had fast times, kept them up. They were done by their second, uh, their follow-up album. It's just, it's, it's crazy to watch all these things track. It's been a load of fun um, for people uh listening enjoyed this scott and i enjoyed it a lot and the plan life is crazy so we'll tell you the plan that we talked about is to next summer 
do the summer of 93 at 30. Sliver! Sliver. Uh, that's the plan. Things can change. We never know, but we would like to do a different summer of a different decade. And that summer turns 30. That's your Jurassic Park summer, folks. So, and Cliffhanger, which we mentioned earlier. Is, 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 <laughs> Cliffhanger came out that year. Super Mario Brothers. Oh. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Maybe this time I'll watch that like illegal work print version or whatever that's running around YouTube. There you go. But yeah. I mean, so I'll buy the legit one just to keep us safe. Mm -hmm. We have another thing that's going to come in the in-between that I'm going to keep a surprise for now, but we're going to be working on it. Um, but it's, it's a kind of a, a, another thing I wanted to do. Uh, but yeah. And before time? No, not yet. Not yet. Uh, <laughs> I, when I do Inside it, joke. Sorry. when I do it, it ends, Scott. When I do that's Slam true. Before Time, what is there? It has to be there? the last one. What is there? <laughs> <laughs> what is there? So I'm kind of, you know, filling these retrospective things. We're having fun. The Brad Peters show is going to go back to it's come somewhat normal for, but there's going to be some things. Scott and I are going to put together a new package of a, of a retrospective to do. And then next summer, look forward to, uh, we might have multiple packages of things. I don't know how it's going to go, but um, summer of summer of 93 at 30 will be the next one. Very exciting. Uh, but yeah, appreciate everybody listening in. Uh, Scott, one more time before we go. What can people keep up? Orbs.com. If they haven't been listening to the end of these episodes. Yeah, I mean, come yeah. on. I've been the same place for nine years. There you go. Forbes.com. Um, Google there? the ticket booth, Scott Mendelson, Forbes. I've got a Twitter thing and at Scott Mendelson. And I got a Facebook page if you want cat pictures. He's got more followers than me on, on Twitter, believe it or not. More way more that's because i'm on there way too much there you go i yeah i'm doing other things um i'm on twitter and instagram at brand 4 khd uh you know what though folks we're gonna put the cherry on top next week stay tuned uh we will put the epilogue to this as we will cover the sword and the sorcerer and porkies to give you one last toast and leave hopefully on a happy note rather than <laughs> these three garbage movies we ended with Oh, uh, so one by more default, week. yes, yes. So there'll be one more week of us in '82, not in the summer, but just before summer, just before summer for me and you. So till then, stay film positive. I'll wait till next week before I, I sing Into the West by Annie Lennox and Howard Shore. All right, you heard it, folks. The summer of '82 at four. Thank you for listening. The Brandon Peters Show is a Creative Zombie Studios production. Produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters. Written and edited by Brandon Peters. Announcer vocals by Jessica Olsman. Theme song by Metavari. Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. The Summer of 82 at 40 and News of the Moment themes by Press Maxson. Additional information on this and other episodes at thebrandonpetershow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at thebrandonpetershow.com. Show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found.